I think we're going to get going. Good morning. My name is Walter Nunes. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Disability Law Center. I'm a middle-aged white man with uh, longish brown hair, got bookshelves in the background, and I'm wearing a brown short sleeve shirt with stripes. Uh, preferred pronouns are he, him, and his. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, staff attorney, Ginger Gates. Ginger, you want to say hello? Sure. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ginger Gates. I'm a staff attorney at the Disability Law Center. <clears throat> I'm a woman in my late 20s with blonde hair, and I'm wearing dark framed glasses. I'm also wearing a light blue dress shirt, um, and my background is mostly white. You can see my wardrobe in the background there. Um, I use the pronouns she and her, and I do just want to let you all know that this session is being recorded and will be um, on DLC's website um, in the near future. So, um, Walter, back to you. Thanks, Ginger. Uh, I'd like to remind folks that our final training of this sixth uh, training session, entitled Rights Regarding Discharge and Treatment in the Community, will be on September 14th. I believe that'll be a Tuesday. All of the events have been on Tuesday. Um, today's subject matter is, is filing a complaint. It's kind of dense. Uh, the number of slides, I think, is 28 or 29. Uh, our goal is to make all of these presentations as interactive as possible. Uh, we welcome your questions and your comments. Uh, there are places, sort of natural places in the presentation where we will pause and ask folks if they have questions. I encourage my colleague, attorney Gates, to jump in at any time with any comments or questions or pointing out things that I may say in error. Uh, and also we only have an hour to do this. So uh, we're not gonna review all of the slides in the PowerPoint. You will have, you do have copies of the PowerPoint and, you, and if there are particular issues or particular slides that I skip over and anyone feels that they have questions or issues that they wanna discuss uh, about that individual slide, we're happy to do it. Certain things we feel are uh, more important with respect to the filing of complaint and the investigations of complaints. There are issues like reconsideration, uh, appeals, department case files, public logs, monitoring responsibilities, all of that is in the PowerPoint but it may be that we're just not gonna be able to get to it because this hour goes pretty quickly. Uh, a little history about the complaint system. Um, some of you may know attorney Bob Fleischner, terrific advocate uh, for persons with lived experience. Uh, apparently back in the day, there was no complaint system at all. Uh, persons who were in psychiatric hospitals had no recourse whatsoever. Bob advocated successfully and the complaint process was created. I believe that was in the mid eighties. At that time, there was only one type of complaint that could be filed. We're gonna call that a 10 day fact finding complaint, which is self-explanatory. A complaint is then assigned to what we call the responsible party. And that person conducts a 10 day fact finding. Uh, and then makes a recommendation and a decision is, uh, is, is uh, arrived at. Um, however, as time went by, people started to see, clients started to see that their complaints were not being handled in a timely fashion. The facilities were saying that the number of complaints were too much for them to handle. So the complaint system was bifurcated into two. The 10 day fact finding remained with the hospitals and they conduct the 10 day fact finding, but the Office of Investigations was created to handle uh, specific complaints of a more serious nature, death, things of that nature. And that is handled by the Department of Mental Health Office of Investigation, which has their own battery of investigators. And in my experience, they do a pretty good job and we're gonna get into the Office of Investigations and those types of complaints. Um, recently, a third level of uh, complaint was added to the other two, and that's called administrative resolution. Uh, the administrative resolution was created much the same reason the Office of Investigations was created because facilities felt that they, were, they just couldn't handle all the complaints that they were receiving, particularly the private hospitals. And so, a 
I don't want to call it a lower rung, but an administrative review is for a type of complaint which is viewed as not serious. Uh, a good friend, colleague and friend of mine often refers to it as the cold soup complaint. You'll hear a little bit more about the cold soup complaint later on. Um, and so we now have three levels of complaints. Uh, administrative resolution, which is a, let's call it an entry level, for lack of a better word, 10-day fact-finding, which is a thorough complaint uh, investigated, a thorough investigation conducted by the facility, and a 30-day fact-finding conducting by the Office of Investigations for Serious Matters. Um, in doing this review, I, I I, I like to see associations, it's just my nature. I notice that a lot of things are in threes in this uh, in this complaint error. Um, for example, there are three levels of complaint, administrative resolution, 10-day uh, fact finding, and 30-day investigation. Uh, there are three ways to substantiate a complaint, be it dangerous, illegal, or inhumane. And there are three levels of appeal. One is reconsideration, one is appeal, and one is further appeals that are available in certain circumstances to certain types of complaints. A lot of this stuff is a little, uh, uh, we don't want to get too much in the weeds. So let's begin and let's start with the first, uh, the second slide, which is called scope and purpose. And quite simply, uh, the regulations that govern complaints are 104 CMR 3200. And a complaint can be filed at any program or facility operated, licensed, or contracted by the Department of Mental Health. That includes um, group homes, uh, ACCS vendors, anything that is operated, contract, or licensed by the Department of Mental Health is grist to the mill and something that a complaint can be filed. Uh, complaints are not the regulations do not include investigating a complaint against the recipient of a service. What does that mean? Not a client, uh, except if there's an incident where um, something occurs uh, as a result of an error or omission by staff that created a dangerous or illegal or inhumane condition. In my experience, I have not seen that used, but I think it's fair to say that. Um, the complaints are the purpose behind the complaints is to lodge complaints against staff, the facilities, the department, the hospital, et cetera, and not so far as against other clients, other peers. It's not to say that it can't be done, but only when it can only be done when it implicates some failure on the part of staff. Let's say some two good people were not getting along that well. Staff took no steps to uh, keep these two people at arm's length and they got into an altercation. That would be that would come back on the staff rather than a complaint against the individuals. Uh, so let's move on to uh, slide three. And this is the first of our threes, which talks about dangerous, illegal, and inhumane. In order for a complaint, to even be investigated, either be an administrative resolution, 10 day or 30 day, it must be dangerous, illegal, or inhumane. So let's just talk about the definition. Dangerous means posing a danger to the health or safety of a client. Now that would include not only the compliant, compliant pardon me, the client, but any other person who's affected by that health or safety. That could be, you know, it could be heating, it could be uh, malodor. It could be. Uh, it could be anything. It could be weather, like we all worried about Henri over the weekend. Um, it could be anything that poses danger and healthy health and safety of a client. Uh, really hot weather. Air conditioning is not working. That would certainly be one. Uh, a violation of law, which means just that, and not just a statute, but case law, regulations. I would argue even a policy. Uh, this kind of brings me back and will bring me back to the cold soup complaint, which we hear so much of. Um, the third is inhumane, which is is defined as demeaning to a client or inconsistent with proper regard for human dignity. I think that speaks for itself, but I, I think that that's, that allows for 
a broad interpretation. So, you know, I, I've got a little note here to myself, and sometimes these, although broad on their face, dangerous, illegal, and inhumane, in interpretation, they are really, I mean, they don't define dangerous in a broad way. Let's just go out on a limb a little bit. Maybe we can talk about triggering of people, uh, dangerous for a person. Uh, certain triggers might cause them to engage in self-injurious behavior. Um, illegal, again, um, it's not just a big crime. It's not just uh, stealing somebody's wallet or whatnot. It does implicate things like what is required under health and safety laws, uh, of inspection laws, heating, air conditioning, quality of food. Is it at the right temperature? Is it served at the right temperature? So I would argue that cold soup in and of itself should not be uh, cast aside as not meeting a requirement of illegal um, because food that's not kept at the right temperature can cause foodborne illness, as we all know. Demeaning to a client, again, very, very broad and should be viewed as broad. Some persons want to work with staff of, a, of, a, of the same gender, particularly in bathing or toileting or showering or dressing. Um, uh, so I wanted to stop there and just ask if anybody wanted to make a comment or ask any questions just about the idea that in order for a complaint to be investigated, it must be considered dangerous, illegal, and inhumane. Who makes that decision, and what are the what what are your options when people say your complaint doesn't count? So, Ginger, or uh, do we have any persons who are speaking up on this issue? If not, I'll move on. But I don't see any questions or comments right now. Um, but okay. I just wanted to jump in and and make a note that um, as you were talking about. Um, dangerous conditions that are, you know, danger to health or safety of a client. I was thinking about, of course, the pandemic that we're all living through right now and how some of those conditions at, at a hospital or a congregate care facility, for example, can be really more dangerous than, um, you know, those of us who are not living in those, in those types of facilities. So I just wanted to make a note of that. That is really, really helpful. And I, I you know, we think that after living through this pandemic for a year and a half, uh, almost I'm getting immune to it. I'm not thinking it as much I as know. I should, but that's great. But also visitors who want to see their loved one, their family member, and how they're impacted as well. Sure. Um, yeah, I think that's a great observation. We so do with that, have, a, we do have just one question that sure. I think is important to ask. Um, is yelling at a client, is that considered inhumane? I, I certainly would. would. Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I'd probably consider it a violation of law as well. I mean, I would consider it yeah. on its face abuse. Uh, yeah. And also it could be all three. I mean, danger to the health of safety of a client. I mean, absolutely. People are triggered by those kinds of behaviors and, uh, and it's unacceptable. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this in depth, but thank you for that question. Absolutely. Sure. No one should be yelling at anybody and certainly not staff. So, but I, I would encourage people to think of dangerous, illegal, and inhumane in the broadest terms possible, because I think there is a real trend, particularly among the private facilities, to say, well, these don't meet the test, and we don't have to investigate this, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's go to slide four. And this is very broad, and this is dealing with all types of complaints, whether they're of the three types. Any person can file a complaint when they believe it's dangerous, illegal, or inhumane. The client believes it's dangerous, illegal, or inhumane. Right there in the regulation, they should be the determinant of what is dangerous, illegal, or inhumane. An employee who becomes aware that a client wants to file a complaint, they gotta help them, they shall. It's an, uh, it's an affirmative obligation. They must help them, um, including maybe writing it if necessary. Human rights officer shall assist in the filing complaints, and if necessary, reach out to an attorney or advocate or peer, I would say, um, to assist in the actual writing of a complaint. And I think the writing of a complaint, and, and just as an aside, uh, if you have five or six issues, you might want to file five or six complaints. Uh, I think each complaint should be one issue, very specific. Uh, I think when people 
and rightly so, want to say everything that they're upset about in one complaint, it gets very confusing and it's hard to focus. Um, no retaliation. You hear a lot of times about people being afraid that if they complain, they'll retaliate against. Um, I've certainly heard that over the years. It is completely unacceptable. It should not be a deterrent for filing a complaint. If anybody files a complaint and they have a loss of privilege or a loss of opportunity or maybe change of staff that's not related to the decision, that is extremely serious and it becomes a matter of a secondary complaint. And I would say from the Disability Law Center's perspective, if anybody feels that they're a victim of retaliation for filing a complaint, I would encourage you folks to contact us. Um, any employee who receives a complaint shall immediately have forwarded to the person in charge, period. And the person in charge is generally the CEO. We're gonna hear about responsible person uh, the distinction between the person in charge is responsible person is person in charge is just that the CEO, the director, whatever they call the person. The person responsible is the person who was assigned to investigate a complaint. Um, let's go to uh, the first of the three types of complaints. Slide five: When a complaint received is received by the Office of Investigations, and by the way, this is the second of our threes the three types of complaints. So uh, I refer to these first are the big six. If any of these occur, uh, medical legal death, a person who dies in a hospital, sexual assault or abuse, physical assault or abuse, which results in serious physical harm. I put question marks on that for myself. What, what does that really mean? I mean, I, I, some of these things are not defined to my satisfaction. Serious physical harm for one person may be something else for another. Attempted suicide, which results in serious physical harm. Commission of a felony. Well, a, com a commission of a felony is also an assault, be it a physical or a sexual assault. Um, and serious physical injury resulting from restraint or seclusion practices. Uh, extremely important. Um, and then there's what I, number seven, and it's not necessarily a catch all, but Something that falls outside of those six uh, reasons for a complaint is an incident that the person in charge believes is sufficiently serious or complicated as to require investigation by the Office of Investigations or the Director of Licensing. Um, sometimes when you know something is just really bad and it doesn't fit neatly into one of these six, that's when the complaint should be arrange that it is sufficiently serious or complicated. And following up on Ginger's point, that could be something that grows out of the pandemic and policies that are being created as a result of the pandemic. Um, if we can go on with number six, slide six. Um, when one of these, these seven types of complaints come in, um, the person in charge shall forward it to the responsible person. Uh, briefly, number slide seven defines that the responsible person uh, and what their duties are, they shall assign a public blog number, which is really important because that's why later when we're trying to figure out how many complaints have been filed or looking back on something, there'll be a number. Um, they will refer it to the Office of Investigations. They'll notify all parties, including the human rights officer, that the complaint has been referred to the Office of Investigations. Um, in complaints that are not one of the seven that we outlined, uh, the person in charge shall be, shall be the responsible person. They also will assign a public log number, and that person will determine whether it will be um, resolved by administrative resolution or a 10-day fact-finding. Again, the Office of Investigations is a separate office with uh, uh, they, they're not in a hospital. They're, they're, they're actually, I believe they're in the North Shore somewhere. They have investigators. They have folks who do that work. They are as independent as any sub-organization within the department can be. I, I think they have a lot of, uh, I think they have a lot of responsibility. And I think they take it seriously. When it comes to a 10-day fact-finding or an administrative resolution, those are done in-house. So let's go on to slide eight and talk about administrative review. So, so the first thing this 
responsible person, who in this case is likely the person in charge, well, they'll just go down this list. If they saw, find that it's not dangerous, illegal, or inhumane, inhumane, it is not going to be treated as a 10-day fact finding. So in other words, if somebody, I don't know, I, I think this is really important. Um, and I don't mean to keep going back to the cold soup, but if somebody did say, every day <clears throat> I get my lunch and it's always cold. Um, the cold soup has been used as an example for what, what constitutes a complaint that should be treated with administrative review. I, I don't accept that at all. And others can disagree. What, what they're trying to do with the creation of administrative review is to take the burden off facilities, particularly private facilities who are feeling overwhelmed with the number of complaints. Please forgive me if I sound cynical. Uh, one way to reduce the number of complaints is to do a better job. Uh, I'm not suggesting that people don't do as good a job as possible, but it does beg the question when complaints are being filed at such a high number that we had to change the regulations because the facilities could not keep up with them. So of this list, uh, objectively impossible. Again, I don't really know what that means. I mean, you know, uh, someone you know, like, I guess you could say that George Washington came into my unit and said something mean to me. I guess they would consider that objectively impossible, but uh, previously investigated and decided, I'll kind of give them that one, although, I would want to make sure that it's not a similar event, but you're filing a complaint on the exact same thing. You know, uh, on Tuesday, Walter Nunes came into my room and called me in name and they filed a complaint and they made a decision. It was found objectively impossible because I was I was working from home and I never was in the facility. But by the same token, if it was a similar sounding complaint, then it's not previously investigated and decided. Um, does not present a health or safety risk. Um, again, these are all, they're baseline, but they are, I think they need to be questioned. Uh, what presents a health or safety risk? A lot has to do with a person's individual immune response system or the sensitivity. The person is allergic to things or they're more susceptible to catch a cold or they have asthma or you name it, or allergies. There are lots of reasons why it would it may present a health or safety risk to one but not to another uh, if the client withdraws a complaint uh, hopefully not under threat of retaliation um, it can be uh, placed in the administrative review column but only when it doesn't concern the health and safety of another individual last heading is undisputed facts um, i think these are all can be valid based upon the facts, based upon the incident, but they also can be invalid. Um, I have done numerous complaints in my time. I think that the main problem with the administrative review is that it doesn't, it allows the facility to determine that something is not dangerous, illegal, or inhumane before they have conducted any type of meaningful investigation. In my experience, when someone calls you up or asks to speak with you and they say something which may seem objectively impossible or it just you just can't see how it could have happened, I have found that when you talk to the person, particularly a person who might be going through crisis or might be at an acute stage of their disability, that maybe they don't say everything correctly. Maybe they make a mistake in how they report it. Um, my main problem with administrative review is that it doesn't allow for even a general investigation. The best example I have is a client who told me that staff kept staring at him and made him feel uncomfortable. I think that's a problem. I think it could even be considered inhumane, but, but it was not treated seriously. But when I talked to the client, there was more to the story. What he said was he walked up to that staff person and he said, why are you always staring at me? And that staff person punched the client directly in the mouth, knocking him out, all of which was covered on 
video, all of which was captured on video, which became an Office of Investigation complaint. The state police became involved, and the person who did the punching was uh, unceremoniously separated from the department. So, you know, I think there needs to be some level of investigation. Uh, let's move on to slide nine, and we'll talk about that, because this does talk about what level of investigation. We're at about the halfway point. I want Ginger or anybody else to know that anytime you want to jump in, please jump in with questions, concerns, comments, anything that I'm not making clear. Um, so I'll take a breath. Hearing nothing. Thanks, Walter. Uh, there, there aren't any questions right now. Okay, um, terrific. Okay. Um, so when a, when a case is being treated as administrative review, review uh, the responsible person must meet with the client or complainant. Sometimes they're not the same person. Um, and, but then they say, if possible. Now, it could simply mean the person has been discharged, but generally speaking, they know how to get in touch with someone. It could be that the person has been discharged and they're no longer interested in talking about it. Um, the, the individual has the right that the human rights officer can be there. And, uh, and unless the client cannot attend the meeting, the meeting shall take place within three days. Uh, you know, here we have uh, another set of threes. The purpose of this meeting is to review the allegation, uh, whether or not there are disagreements that require, require fact finding, which I think would be a good idea because that's when you get to the heart of the matter and discuss and if possible, agree upon actions that may be taken by the responsible person. Uh, again, the so-called so cold soup complaint. Um, if that's what somebody's complaining about, there is this sense of freedom among numerous facilities that they can just, they can blow this off. They can say, you know, I'm really sorry that the soup was cold. We'll talk to the chef and, you know, that matter is resolved. Um, the person does not receive a decision letter per se. They receive a notice and um, they do have the right to have request an appeal or reconsideration. Uh, perhaps it's too broad of a statement on my part, but I think that if anybody files a complaint and it's relegated to administrative review, unless it is very, very clear that, this, that there are no issues in dispute, no facts in dispute, um, then I, 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 I don't see any downside from requesting reconsideration or filing an appeal on that matter. Um, I have done appeals for persons who had been placed in physical restraints and injured in physical restraints that were treated as an administrative review, um, resolution, forgive me, administrative resolution. I think there's a danger that this is being used far too frequently and, and I think we all need to be vigilant about, not that, the, that this third level exists, but that it's being used properly. Um, and so, um, and here's, this is a good regulation in slide 10. If the responsible person being responsible determines that the criteria for administrative review is not met, then they can order it to be treated as for a 10 day fact finding or to be moved to the office of investigation. For example, if somebody had spoken to the client and then learned that it was more than staring at the client, but the staff had actually punched the client, actually point of fact, the same staff punched the same client on two different instances. Uh, that's, a, that's another story. At any rate, that matter was obviously then turned over to the office of investigation, but it would not have been if the Disability Law Center didn't meet with the client, talk to the client, review the videotape and find out what exactly happened. Um, so I think in most situations where the issue is decided by administrative re review, the client or the complainant may wanna think about or talk to an attorney at the Disability Law Center about whether they want to appeal that decision. I think it's all of our responsibility to make sure that the administrative resolution is not used as a catch-all for uh, just kind of uh, whittling down the number of complaints that facilities have to investigate. Um, to the opposite effect, if something is considered a 10-day fact-finding, 
it could also occur that uh, they may find through their investigation, the 10 day fact finding, that this matter would have been better uh, served as an administrative resolution. I have much less problem with that because they have conducted the 10 day fact finding. They talk to people, they investigate, they review the record, et cetera. And so I, you know, I feel a little bit better about that. Uh, slide 11 talks about um, the, what the responsible person should have to do, um, and which is to assign the matter for fact finding uh, that can be extended, which I'm always in favor of them expend, ex, ex, uh, extending the amount of time to, to do an investigation that gives more reason for the, um, the things to be uncovered. And the individual who does the fact finding shall provide a written report and make recommendations to the responsible person. The responsible person will issue the decision letter. And let's go on to slide 12 and we're gonna take a pause there. Um, the decision that a person receives from a 10 day fact finding should talk about finding of facts and placing those facts uh, in, in, in relief with the regulation or statute, make recommendations the actions that should be taken, inform the parties of the right to request reconsideration and the right to appeal. Um, and again, if at any time during formal fact finding, it is determined that the criteria for administrative resolution is really what's going on here, they can change the status and determine that should be treated as administrative resolution. Again, I have less of a problem with them lowering the level of investigation when they've at least initiated with the 10 day fact finding rather than the reverse. So where are we? We have discussed the three types of complaints and I would really like to hear from anybody who is files a complaint or has an opinion on the administrative resolution process. Um, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm alone in being concerned about the administrative resolution process. Uh, so I'd like to open it up for questions or comments if folks would like to chime in. I, there are a couple of questions. Um, the first one, can I file a complaint with DMH if I was not on the receiving end of the abuse at the facility? I was in an inpatient unit years ago where I saw someone die due to the negligence of the staff and I want to report it if I can. Yes, the answer is yes. It's the client or the complainant. The complainant does not have to be the person who suffered the injury or abuse or neglect. I mean, as a matter of fact, sometimes it's the staff who has to file the complaint or the human rights officer. As a matter of fact, it's not in the regulations anymore, but it, I, I remember in my, in my youth, uh, of it saying that every person is a human rights officer. Every single person who serves clients in psychiatric facilities or programs has an affirmative obligation to, you know, if you see something, say something. So insofar as what you observed in a facility, you absolutely can file a complaint. There is no statute of limitations on a complaint. Uh, the only challenge with the amount of time that has elapsed would be the ability to speak to the client or the, in this case, if it was a death, the person who was, um, who was uh, next of kin or other people affected, uh, the record should still exist. Uh, the written record should still exist. Sometimes it, it becomes a challenge with doing a thorough investigation. The more time that goes by, the harder it is to find the witnesses and the necessary documents. But absolutely, a complaint can filed at any time. If a complaint, particularly a complaint of that happened a while ago, if it happened in a private facility, or another way to say it, a program licensed by the Department of Mental Health, being a private hospital, I'm not picking on anyone, we'll just say McLean's for lack of a better name, I would send those sort of complaints to the Director of Licensing. If it involves a licensed facility, I would send it to the, um, the director of licensing. And I don't think she would mind my saying, and that's Janet Ross. Janet Ross is very good at her job and she's particularly good at making sure complaints are investigated. So that would be my recommendation there. If it occurred at a state operated facility, 
um, I would probably send it to the person in charge of that facility or the area, the, the director, the area director for be the Northeast area, the Southeast area, Metro Boston area, that would be reasonable. I don't think I would send it to the commissioner right off, but I would send it to the area office and the director of that office. Um, anything else? Yes, there's one more question. Um, sure. Is the 10 day fact finding 10 calendar days or 10 business days? Um, generally speaking, and we could we did this on a question we had last week. Generally, if the number is 10 or lower, it is, uh, <laughs> it is business days. Uh, it's generally when you talk about 30 days and things like that, it's calendar days. We could research that for you if you'd like us to and put it up on the website or you could, there's a, at the end of the slideshow, there's an address uh, that you can ask any other question. I don't know dispositively, but intuitively, I think it is business days when it's 10 days or less. However, either party can ask for an extension. Um, the department is very generous. You know, you have so many days to file an appeal or file a complaint, but generally speaking, good cause is broadly interpreted. I have never had the experience of a request for a late appeal or a filing of a late uh, further appeal. I've never been refused on those issues. So, um, but we can look up exactly what 10 days mean with respect to uh, the complaint process, but I think we're gonna find that it is business days. Anything else? That looks okay. Oh, so maybe we are gonna, go ahead. Sorry, there's one more. Um, can oh, you we wanna hear. Yeah. <laughs> can you file a complaint verbally to the human rights officer versus filling out a complaint form? Yes, you can. Um, yeah. However, I would, and you know, I, you know, I mean, there are lots of reasons, you know, a person might be uh, not feel comfortable writing, a person might be, have some uh, other disabilities where writing might be problematic. I think gener there's no requirement that a complaint needs to be written. However, I think, um, I don't know if we talked, we passed through this regulation, but if, for example, you meet with the human rights officer, and one, and we'll get to this if we haven't run past it already. If the human rights officer perceives, actually we did, it talks about talking to a lawyer. It's not just when the human, you speak to the human rights officer, but it's when the human rights officer recognizes that the individual, um, here it is, human rights officer shall assist clients filing complaints and shall use best efforts to return, refer a client who lacks or appears to lack capacity or upon request to an attorney or an advocate if necessary. So I think you want the complaint to ultimately be put in writing. Yeah. Why? Because you can state the fact. I mean, complaints are really fact specific, uh, right? That's painfully obvious. But, you know, you, I've seen complaints that have been failed, not substantiated because you said, Tom, on Tuesday, Tom Jones called me a name. And someone will check the, 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 who worked on that day. And some will say, well, Tom Jones didn't work that day. So that's going to fall under the objectively impossible criteria. And that will be unsubstantiated because of an error in fact that Tom didn't work on that day. Um, and, I, and I think it's really uh, overly narrow. I, I think that, you know, persons live in a facility, um, days blend into each other. It's not always clear what it is. Um, Many hospitals, many facilities have long, dark corridors. You may not know whether it was morning or afternoon. I think that when writing a complaint, you should be as accurate and factually specific as possible. But I would also be cautious about listing a fact that you're not really sure about. I mean, if it was a male staff and you don't know whether it was Tom Jones or Bill Jones, you're better off just saying male staff. Uh, and you may not know whether it was the morning or afternoon, but you might know it was the first shift, which goes from seven to three, second shift, three to 11, third shift, 11 to seven. So you want to identify the parameters as much as possible, but you don't want to, 
you don't want to identify it in such a way that you you provide the opportunity for a complaint to be unsubstantiated. And, and this is a word we haven't even spoken about. They never say, well, this didn't happen. They never say to the complainant, well, we investigated this and, you know, you're full of baloney. What they always say is we could not substantiate the complaint. And that's a pretty high burden to place on a person living in a hospital or a program to be able to state things with such a high degree of specificity to for a complaint to be substantiated. Um, and we'll talk about why we think reconsideration and appeals are appropriate, why it can be very appropriate to work with an attorney or the human rights officer in the, the drafting of a complaint, to limiting a complaint, each complaint to one specific issue rather than writing everything a person is upset about in a, on a given day. Not that it's not valid, but you might want to do it one complaint at a time. I hope that is helpful. Anything else, Ginger, at this juncture? We have about 20 minutes left and, a, yeah. and being conscious of, of the time. Sure. Um, just one comment. Um, I filed a complaint before and they did not address my concern in a letter to me. This has happened to another client as well. Um, I'm not at all surprised. Right. I'm sorry to say that, but that's, you know, um, I, I guess without taking up a lot of other folks times, but, you know, um, if it was a complaint that was, if you were still at the facility you should have received something. If you had been discharged, you should have received writing. I mean, I think having filed a complaint and not receiving a response, right in there, you've just moved it up to a 10-day fact finding. Right there, you've, you are now violating the law that mm -hmm. they did not investigate, that they did not provide you with any kind of notice. They did not provide you with your right to reconsideration or appeal. It is now uh, another kettle of fish. It is a much more serious violation. Not that the original complaint wasn't a serious violation, but now you're essentially saying, I was blown off. And I think the risk of being blown off, I mean, we have three levels of complaints because facilities say, this is too hard to do. This is too time consuming. DMH, take the burden off our shoulders of having to investigate complaints, of having to write decision letters, of having to respond to the, to the concerns of the people we are here to serve. The failure of a facility to investigate a complaint even on the administrative resolution level, is completely unacceptable. Again, depending on how long ago, I'm not suggesting not to file a new complaint or to raise the issue or even to contact Disability Law Center to speak about it, but the more time that elapses, it simply becomes harder to show. But that does not mean you give up. Um, I find that we are much more successful in getting positive results on the appellate level uh, and on what was called a further appeal. In some instances, you can ap appeal something all the way up to the commissioner. Um, we are about halfway through the slides. I know we're not gonna get through all of them. Shall we move on or do we wanna talk a little bit further here? I think we're ready to move on. Thanks so Terrific. much. Walter. Slide 14 is a little, it just talks about Similarly, if something is uh, sent to the Office of Investigations, if the Office of Investigations, no, no, this is not one of the six uh, uh, articulated reasons for a complaint, nor is it sufficiently complicated to warrant an Office of Investigation, they can refer it back down to a 10-day fact-finding. But again, at least it got the attention of the Office of Investigation, and I have less of a problem with things being stepped down rather than things being um, except after investigation of things being identified as administrative resolution before there's been any investigation. Slide 15 talks about the responsibility of the investigator, who generally speaking with the Office of Investigations, they do a good job. They conduct an investigation and they write a report. Some of these reports are 50 and 60 pages long. They interview witnesses, they review um, documents. Uh, I've done many death investigations. The investigators report will include reports from the, um, the, 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 the examiner, the police department, the EMTs. The 
they generally do a good job. The investigator does not make the decision. However, they make a recommendation and it's the person in charge who um, makes a determination of whether the client complaint will be substantiated or not. Slide 16 talks about the distinction between the investigator and the responsibilities of the responsible person, which is kind of a mouthful. Uh, they can take recommendations of the investigator and they say, yeah, we agree. And we're either going to uh, affirm your findings or we're going to, well, affirm them insofar as that we're going to substantiate or unsubstantiate based upon, I apologize, I'm going to shut that off. I thought I had done that prior to, I apologize. So they can take the, uh, the, uh, the recommendations of the investigator. They can go out and say, no, let's do additional fact finding, which again is a good thing that they're looking deeper. And the, the, the person who's responsible, they can go in a completely different direction. They can say, no, we're, we're not gonna accept what you suggested uh, and we're not gonna do fine fact finding we may just treat this completely differently. Uh, but they do have to explain the rationale for why they didn't accept it, the investigator's conclusions and to identify what any corrective actions can be taken. Um, one of the things that's really interesting and really good about appeals is that particularly when, when we file appeals, we are putting specific corrective actions in our recommendation. We're not saying simply, please substantiate this complaint. We are also saying substantiate this complaint and take the following steps so that this problem doesn't occur again. Um, there is some um, limits on what can be uh, obtained by uh, somebody who is reviewing uh, uh, the information from the fact finder. Um, and depending on who's requesting the information on their authority to receive the information, uh, they may receive redacted documents. As the protection and advocacy system, we have we have investigation authority uh, given to us by the federal government. However, when we invoke that authority, we will get all unredacted documents, but we have limits on how we can use that information. We are required as a matter of law to treat that information as confidential as the source we obtained it from, which essentially means if you were to call me up and tell me a story and I agreed that it was really serious and I said, okay, we're gonna investigate this as the protection and advocacy system. However, if we do that, I cannot tell you what I found out. Now, however, we do issue reports, we do take steps and the person can still benefit from our work, but insofar as talking about the specifics about what we learn as the PNA, we are prohibited from doing so. So that's an important decision about when we invoke PNA authority. And it's a decision that the complainant should be a part of. They may want to contact a private attorney and file a, uh, a civil action. Uh, and that attorney who files a civil action would also have access to unredacted documents uh, through discovery. Um, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly. Slide 17 talks about a request for reconsideration. We're not going to talk about it. However, reconsideration is a step in between a decision letter and an appeal. Um, I have never requested reconsideration, but after doing this work in preparation for today, I see very little downside in requesting reconsideration, simply because when you request re reconsideration, and it could be of any type of complaint, administrative resolution, 10-day or 30-day, you're basically saying the, the finder of fact didn't talk to a witness, um, the decision is not supported by the facts, or the decision is an error of law. That's the exact same standard that uh, you would use on an appeal. You have to basically have a basis for an appeal other than I don't agree with what you're saying. You have to, you know, you didn't talk to me. You didn't talk to the eyewitness. Uh, you didn't. You didn't get all the facts. Those are all bases for both reconsideration and appeal. Um, when a person requests reconsideration, uh, the responsible party must make a decision whether or not they are going to do a reconsideration, um, and whether or not additional fact finding is required. However, whatever that person decides, 
the individual will always maintain their right of appeal. In other words, if a person goes down the road of reconsideration and reconsideration takes place and the responsible person does not change their mind, they affirm the complaint, the decision that they originally got, in other words, it was unsubstantiated, it is still unsubstantiated, that individual who filed the complaint still has the right to file an appeal. One consideration in reconsideration is that um, if the if if after reconsideration the responsible party changes their mind, in other words, they go from unsubstantiated to substantiated, the party complained about has the right to request reconsideration, which is only fair. And and I am not at all averse to. I think the more investigation that's done, the better. The more independent the investigator is, the better. The more time it takes for the investigator to do a thorough job, the better. Any questions on reconsideration? Slide 19, we talk about appeal. It is essentially the same. Uh, an appeal must be granted if the fact finder failed to interview an essential witness did not apply, uh, that the facts do not support the decision or the decision is based on an interpretation of law. Um, and the appeals process slide 20 talks about, um, you know, whether or not it's a 10 day fact finding or a 30 day, uh, what the request for extension of time, um, a little more time is granted to the Office of Investigation. Again, I have seen no, um, I've, never been re I've never been denied a good cause request for more time. I don't know of anyone who has been um, denied a good cause extension. Why? Because fair is fair. And lots of times the person who's filing the complaint uh, might be having a difficult time in their life. They may have been discharged, et cetera, et cetera. And there has to be generosity in extending the time. I'm going to not talk about slide 21 or slide 22 um, or, well, briefly slide 23, the commissioner's investigation. Essentially, the commissioner can decide to investigate anything for any reason. Um, and I think there are things out there which, again, Ginger talked about the pandemic. The pandemic may have created uh, heretofore problems that no one had thought about before. And it may cause someone to think, what, what are we gonna do about families who come in from another state to visit their loved one? How, how do we get around this? How, how do we deal with fresh air? Things that were not a problem previously or a problem now. Ginger and I talked briefly yesterday about, you know, with the expansion of uh, eligibility by the Department of Developmental Services for people who are developmentally disabled or intellectually um, uh, have challenges. They now find themselves in sometimes in psychiatric facilities. That opens up a door to a whole new group of problems which could warrant an investigation by the commissioner. It basically, the commissioner becomes the complainant. Um, slide 24 is important and it talks about the minimum requirement of all fact finding. And if there's something that we need to know is that the complainant or the client needs to be interviewed. And slide 25, which you don't have to jump to, that the complainant should be the first person to interview. So many times I have read decision letters where they immediately go to the staff. You know, Walter filed a complaint about you, what happened? Well, that's, I call that poisoning the well. They should be going to the complainant first, getting the story from the compliant, complainant or the client if they're the same person. Find out what they have to say hear what they have to say. Just like my client who said, the staff was staring at me. If they interviewed that client, they would have found out that that staff punched them in the mouth, uh, which indeed happened. Um, interviewing of witnesses, uh, determination of essential facts, good faith effort to interview each witness, 
um, review all incident reports, which would include restraint and seclusion data, really digging deep. Slide 25 basically talks about the requirement that the complainant should be interviewed before any other interviews take place. And actually, whenever I see a decision where the complainant was not interviewed first, that in of itself becomes a basis for an appeal because it's a violation of law. Um, clients who are interviewed have a right to have a designated representative, which could be an attorney. Uh, employees have a right to, or being interviewed, have a right to a designated representative. They are governed by, you know, in DMH, the staff are generally speaking uh, union folks. They can have a union representative there. The files are maintained uh, in the Office of Investigations of all fact finding. I'm going to bring it up because we're getting too close to the end here. Uh, slide 26 talks about the department case file, which says what has to be kept on all complaints. Deci number 27 spells that out in, in greater detail. Slide 28 talks about the public law. These things, all three of these things are really important. For example, if I wanted to know how many complaints in a given hospital were treated as administrative resolutions, this is where I would go to find it out. I would go to the case file and the public log to find out how many, and I'm not going to pick on a hospital, we'll just call it, you know, Sam's Hospital, of, of, of 100 complaints, how many were treated as administrative resolutions? 95? If that were the case, I'd be concerned. Lastly, there are monitoring responsibilities that are affirmative that the department has to monitor the facilities, particularly those that they that they operate, but also those that they license to make sure that complaints are being handled appropriately. Again, I think that if there's any issue with a licensed facility, and that would include a group living environment, I think Janet Ross, she might get mad at me for sending people to her, but I, it's a compliment. She does a very good job. She She holds to the letter of the law, and you may not always agree with her decision, but you will probably find that you got a fair shake. With that, I'm gonna ask if there's anything else anyone has a question on. I apologize, but we did get most of it in and that was a lot of information. So yeah, Ginger, anything anybody might wanna know in the last couple of minutes? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. Um, okay. So I'll just take this opportunity to plug our next um, training, which will be on Tuesday, September 14th. And we will discuss your rights um, related to discharge and treatment in the community. That's also a pretty big topic. So I'll probably be racing through some slides at the end as well. Um, but I'm not seeing any other questions popping up in the chat. So um, if you don't have, if you have any final thoughts, Walter? Well, only one. And I do, you know, I, I'm always conflicted about, you know, how many slides to use. I think we're better off giving you people a PowerPoint that touches on all the topics even if we didn't discuss it today, you are always welcome to contact us with any questions about things we discussed or something that you, you thought about after reviewing, um, reviewing the, um, the PowerPoint. Complaints are a big deal. That's how we keep the department on its toes. And, and we really need to hold their feet to the fire, making another foot comment here, to make sure that this process is being adhered to. Uh, I want to thank Ginger and all of my colleagues at DLC for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this six presentations. I look forward to Ginger's presentation in September. I'm sure it'll be fantastic. Thank you all for being a part of this. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.